everybody, Charles here. This episode is titled, Dr. Angry and Mr. Political. Rule 7 from 12 Rules for Life by Jordan Peterson is, Pursue what is meaningful, not what is expedient. We cover the material, but the title is about me starting the episode angry, tired, and frustrated, and then I finish the episode being political. You may not like my attitude or my politics, and believe me, I get it. Sometimes I don't like my attitude or my politics either, but it doesn't stop me from listening to this show and sharing it with my friends, and it shouldn't stop you either. Enjoy the episode and send any feedback or hate mail to mindfullymasculine at gmail.com. Welcome to the Mindfully Masculine Podcast with Charles and Dan, where we take a conscious, holistic, and direct approach to relationships, mental health, and self-improvement. For additional content, visit our website at mindfullymasculine.com. And to interact with us, our guests, and your fellow listeners, join the Mindfully Masculine group on Facebook. Good morning, Charles. Good morning, Dan. How are you this morning? I'm well. Thank you. How are you? Uh, Dragging a little bit. I uh, had a late night. I went to a comedy show in Tampa Mm. and uh, it got over around 945 ish and I I just bolted right out the door. I I paid for my coffee and bottle of water with cash at the very beginning of the night so I wouldn't have to deal with, you know, receiving a, a bill that I had to pay. Oh, you've done this before. Yeah. And, uh, and plus I, was, I, I knew I wasn't going to eat or drink anything, you know? And so, yeah, I just said, uh, when she came to the table, I was like, I'll take a hot coffee, a bottle of water. Here's a $20 bill. And we don't have to talk again. I didn't say that, <laughs> but that was, that was the plan. That was, that was what was implied. <laughs> yeah. So as soon as the, uh, the headliner who was Mark Norman and he was hilarious as always, um, I think this is probably the, Maybe yeah, the third time I've seen him, and uh, he was amazing. And as uh, soon as he was done, uh, pew, right out the door, and I still didn't get home till real close to midnight. Um, and you those, still made it in those, for uh, those I four express lines were or express lanes were real nice last night. Though, oh, fantastic! Was, there was a lot of red lights in downtown Orlando, and they were not my problem because I <laughs> I was happy to hand my money over to the state to make sure they weren't my problem. Yeah, I like those new express lanes. Yeah, me too. Um, yeah, so I'm a little tired, and right now my my cat's got a case of the zoomies, and he's just going insane. So it's a lot going on. That I, and and then this this chapter we're about to do, rule number seven, is a bit of a slog. Yeah, yeah. And so yeah, we'll see how it goes. But uh, yeah, I'm you know doing all right. I I've already abandoned my hard seventy five hard challenge because of the the mostly because of the water. <laughs> that's crazy. That's, not, that's, e- that's easily the hardest part. A gallon of water. Humans are not meant to drink a gallon of water a day. This is nonsense. So I'm not, I'm not doing it. I'm opting out. Like the benefits could not possibly outweigh how much time I'm spending in the bathroom. So have you thought about trying to do the 75 hard without doing the water part? Just it's, leave that out. It's not the same thing. It's like, have you tried being married without having sex with every woman you want to? It's like, it's not, that's not what it is. <laughs> So you, you, you buy into one of these dumb internet challenges and the only reason you buy into it is to do what it's supposed to be. And mm-hmm. you're like, okay, some, some of my, this, I'm a little aggressive about this because clearly my, you don't say. my friend who I started it with, she's also been like, uh, I'm going to do it, but I'm just not going to do this one part is like, no, then you're not doing it. Yeah. You're just making up your own thing, which is fine. Make up your own thing, but don't pretend like you're doing the thing that you set out to do. And so, no, I'm not doing that. Okay. Like, oh, you could just just do it with half a gallon of, of water. It's like, no, it's not. Again, there's there's no reason to do it. it it's all made up anyway. So if you're so, going to engage in this made up challenge that some guy just comes up with, yeah. then, then do the challenge. So if, my if you want to pick and choose, then you're just picking and choosing. Right. My thought is sorry because you can't because <laughs> you can't tired. because you can't handle the water. My thought is, yeah, you don't have to call it the 75 hard. You could call it 75 medium, you know, and then do it without the water. And if you can do the 75 without adding the water, then you say, all right, I'm going to do the 75 hard. And you add the water then, because then it's a lot, it's a lot less difficult, you know, but okay, I know that's so not, maybe, I know that's not by, your style. Usually. Maybe by the time I work up to it, I won't be dead of old age. I mean, no, screw that. 
Um, oh, so 150 days just can't can't handle that. That's like half a year. No, I'm, yeah. And, and there's and there's no. Ins- I mean, what do I get for doing this challenge? I mean, I'm just clicking little things on a stupid five dollar app that I bought, and I get to feel like I finished it when I'm done. And you know, no, it's 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 not it is not worth it this is this is not something to work up to this is not a marathon this is not okay, climbing so, a mountain so this just out of curiosity stupid, go ahead wow so <laughs> um first of all did you eat yet this morning yes did you have your food okay just I, making sure. I, ate, I went from you sound walk. a little hangry today this morning i it's because i'm tired i'm yes gonna, and then, yeah, and okay. then i got some work stuff i've got to jump on after we're done and oh, it's just like yeah this is not the friday i envisioned for myself okay all right <laughs> what, what 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 got you excited about doing the 75 hard to begin with what did you what did you 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 seem pretty down on the whole thing now but what i mean there must have been something you were you know you thought was i was great know. about just, it you know no. something something to push off the existential dread of life being meaningless i don't know <laughs> and now seemed, now you're not like, it, the dread's gone like some, the, the dread is like gone. something i could do that i would do that would be like oh, oh i've accomplished oh, oh something. don't don't you peterson me right now don't don't do that you know that's it, my favorite expression it, it felt like it felt like something that would be a bit of a stretch but not like undoable yeah. Right. And to yeah. have the have the drinking of the water be the thing that undid me is very right. frustrating. So what I, and help me out. What what were the other parts of it besides the drinking of the water? Sticking to the diet, no alcohol. Okay, so the, easy, so no the problem. Di- so what was the diet? It, it, it's not even a specific diet. It's just pick a diet that you oh. believe is healthy for you and stick okay. to it with no, without cheating. Okay. And, like, and then okay. Okay. And I'm still and then, doing that. Okay. All right. And, and then the uh the two two work two 45 minute workouts a day. Okay. One of which had to be outside. Okay. And it's like, yeah, that's, that's doable too. I mean, I can, I can, okay. make, I, that wasn't a problem. I can make that happen. Cause right. I mean, the first one is just, you know, a walk or a walk run around my neighborhood for 45 minutes, big deal. Yeah. And then the second one, you know, I can just hit some push ups, some pull ups and just keep doing it till failure for 45 minutes. No, no big deal. I, that was not a problem either. Plus I got the bike. I can go for a bike ride. I mean, an hour and a half working out is a very small portion of the day. I can squeeze that in. Okay, so you're basically doing all these things, just not with the water, and then you just get upset. Pretty much, yeah. And then you just get upset if I'm going to put a label on it. <laughs> I guess. Like and then 70, the other thing is like 75 medium. <laughs> the the prog the progress picks every day. You know, taking a picture of your progress. Okay, that also yeah. seems a little vapid and indulgent. Like every day is a lot. I mean, once a week, I think would be enough or once every two weeks, you're not going to see any changes in every day. You know, I mean, that's- well, the thing is, you know, at the end, I'm sure the stupid app that I spent five dollars on probably puts together a nice little sideshow so you could like watch oh, it go over, like a flip you know, book, all- like a flip book. OK, right. Yeah. So I'm sure I'm yeah. sure that's part of the appeal to it. But okay. I don't know. Again, I'm just I'm, I'm frustrated because I was peeing all the time, constantly, nonstop. And yeah. I'm sure if I stuck with it long enough, maybe that would have gone away. But yeah. the other the other thing was, you know, I, I go to breakfast and I drink a bunch of coffee and I drink a bunch of water. And it's like, you know, she's constantly refilling both. And I was like, I don't know how much I'm drinking. There's no way. Right. To, yeah, that's true. No way to you know, that's it. a good point. When you said it the other day, I forgot sometimes they're refilling it when it's like halfway full. Right. And they're not and they're not you know, yeah, it's not completely it's, empty. So, so and then it's, it's really not that accurate. I get it. I get it. It's it, it, even, right. yeah, yeah, even, even when I'm trying, even when I am successfully trying to eat right and manage what food I'm putting in my body, I still eat out a lot because of my work lifestyle and the traveling and, you know, driving here, driving there. So I'm, I'm going to eat meals in restaurants where servers are going to top off my coffee and top off my water. And it's like, I have, yeah. What am yeah. I going to do? I'm going to guess at how much I'm drinking. I know, I know what'll happen. I will, I will overestimate. I'll pretend like I'm drinking more than I actually am because it'll make it easier. Yeah. So then, or so I'll then, go in the wrong direction and do the opposite. And either way, it still doesn't feel like I'm, I'm really participating in this challenge. So it's, it's not for me. It's an all or nothing kind of thing. I get it. I get it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, um, I am on, you know, I slept into like, I go to bed after midnight last night and I slept into like, 5 45 this morning and i still feel like i have not had enough sleep Ooh. and so i'm a little touchy yeah um <laughs> not at you it's just it's not at you are it's you sure you God, I'm feeling, yes, it's definitely I'm, not I'm feeling you. like you've been touching me yeah this sorry. morning it, it's not you it's not the audience it's jordan peterson a little bit but 
it's mostly myself and my cat. Everything's Jordan Peterson a little bit. Yeah, um, yeah it's okay. He's a multimillionaire. He can wait, 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 what's the thickness of this book? Oh my God. Yeah. Um, yeah, like half of it's this chapter. Yeah. No kidding. <laughs> oh wow. This was this was heavy. This was heavy. So um aren't you doing the um on, on a on a lighter note, aren't you doing the pet alliance orientation today? Is yes, today? I'm I'm going nice. to get my orientation as a kitty cuddler. Nice. At uh, Pet Alliance in Sanford, where, um, yeah, hopefully petting some cats will boost the oxytocin and calm me down a little bit. Yeah, you need some oxytocin for sure. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah, I'm going to do that. If I, I could give you a hug through virtual hug, I would. <laughs> oh, that's, that's sweet. Um, yeah, the, yeah, I, I guess if I understand it correctly, my main job is going to be dealing, socializing the cats so that they're cool with hanging out with humans. And nice. uh, even though I failed miserably with my own cat, hopefully I can <laughs> be of some good with the uh, with the strange cats that I'm that I'm going to meet today. Yeah, don't give up on that. That's good. Yeah, no, it's important. It's important. Yeah, and pets pets really make a difference. All right, let's pretend briefly like everything's not about me. What's new with you? <laughs> um, I'm actually going to do the um, uh, the pet alliance. Um, I'm going to be volunteering and going to the orientation next Saturday. So, oh, nice. I'll be doing it for the dog side of things because I am allergic to cats. Um, it seems like it's mostly going to be cleaning up after them. <laughs> And, yeah. and, and, you know, cle- and, and organizing things in a hot, sweaty shelter, but that's okay. Every, you know, every moment counts. And then, you know, I figure also, you know, I know we both were looking to do like the hound around town uh, yes. program, which hasn't started up yet, but I figure, you know what, if, if I'm volunteering there, I'm going to be one of the first people to hear about it coming back. And I might be able to, you know, get yeah, that where of- you adopt the, the dog for the day and you can, you can bring it to different restaurants and parks and stuff like that. So uh, hopefully that comes back soon. Yeah, we should. Uh, you're doing it in Sanford too, right? I am. Yeah. So uh, part of the application process is they'd, they'd like you to be able to do like six hours a month. We should try to coordinate so we can. Oh, that'd be fun. I mean, I'll yeah. be in the cat area. You'll be the dog area. So we right. probably won't get to hang out that much, but at least we right. can, you know, kind of coordinate it a little bit where we're, yeah. where we're both uh, in the on building our, at the same time. Yeah. On our smoke breaks. Yeah. Yeah. Ugh. Oh, I did want to say, so here's something, here's some positive news in case people don't only like hearing me complain. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm working on a new audio book right now and I'm over halfway done with it. Um, I did give up on the secret. It was. Oh, interesting. It, it was. Yeah, it was. I tried, man. I, I really gave it a shot, but it was just the tsunami of horseshit that was coming out of that nice, lovely woman's mouth was just too yeah. much for me to tolerate. It is. It is just too. It's too anti science, anti reason, anti logic for this engineer's brain to to roll with i really i was really hoping i could mine some stuff out of it but i i really do feel like i would i would better spend my time you know going the norman vincent peel or the tony robbins route than mm-hmm. that this particular lady she every, ever, everything everything she said in the book i'd be like oh that'd be cool if it was true but yeah. why why should i believe it was true and she never she never got to part two of you know, here's why you're the universe's most powerful transmitter. I was mm. like, that'd be cool if I could go through life thinking like I'm the world, I'm the universe's most powerful transmitter, but just give me some small reason to believe that that might remotely be true. Yeah. And she's like, nah, no thanks. <laughs> did you ever read Thinking Grow Rich? Yes, I think I did a long time okay. ago. Yeah. We, uh... Yeah, that's the kind of stuff I'm down with because okay. that might be it doesn't do. require a belief in in any kind of magic that is not based in reality whatsoever so look if if the secret changed your life and you're listening to us too congratulations i'm glad i'm glad something changed your life because if that was the book that did it it really needed changing but i just don't see how it happened yeah yeah i mean listen you know right time right place right message sometimes it just doesn't line up i'm glad you brought that up because the book i am reading listening to right now that I'm getting a ton out of is uh, Untamed by Glennon Doyle. And uh, I was thinking on my walk this morning, like, how could I describe this book? And my brain, I want to go through like these big life events that she experienced and then she wrote about. But this book isn't about what happened to her. It's more about who she is Mm. and what the experience of being a human and a woman is like for her. 
And so like to try to boil it down to, well, it's about how her husband cheated on her. And then it's about how she left her husband. And then it's how about how she uh, decided she was in love with a woman and she marries the woman and, and integrates her family with this new woman in her life. And, but it's, it's not just about the things that happened to her. It's, it's more about what it means to her to be a woman. And as you know, a guy who is, is very interested in the women. ideas of masculinity and femininity <laughs> yeah. and women. Yes. <laughs> it's just like, okay, how can I stop myself from trying to boil this down to the things that happened to her and, and more connect to the experience that she's living. And, uh, it's, it's taking active listening and active engagement on my part that I'm finding very stimulating, very, and very interesting. And I'm, I'm looking forward to, uh, to when you, when we get around to doing this book for the podcast and when you listen to it and, and hearing your thoughts about it, because again, like every book we cover, there's stuff she says, and I'm like, Oh, that sounds weird. That sounds wrong. I don't know if that's right. Yeah. But you know, it's, it's making me stretch my brain and my perceptions in a way that I'm really enjoying. And so, um, I think, you know, as two middle-aged dudes with a podcast, I think taking on a book <laughs> like this could be, could be interesting to our listeners and, and could, could be interesting to us too. And the other thing that I'm really enjoying about it is, you know, when she's a great writer and she is really good at uh, making, you know, putting images in the reader's or listener's head. Mm. And so much of what she describes going through and feeling during these big life transitions, I'm identifying so closely with it that it, it, it's making me say, oh, that's that's not a masculine or feminine way to see the world. That's just a human way of seeing the world and seeing your place in it. And it's, it's really, I'm really enjoying it. I'm really getting a lot out of it. I'm probably going to, I'm going to finish it in the next couple of days. I'm, I'm really spending a lot of time, you know, driving and walking. Um, I'm diving into this and uh, I'm really getting a lot out of it. And, and the thing is um, my ex-girlfriend told me about this book and, and how much it meant to her a long time ago. And you know, I was, I was skeptical. I was like, eh, I don't know if this is the kind of thing I can buy into you mm -hmm. know, a few years ago. Yeah. And I'm glad, and I'm glad that I didn't try it a few years ago. Cause I was not ready to, to listen to it then. And, and I am ready to listen to it now. And Renata, uh, recent slash all-star podcast guest Renata, uh, has also, uh, gone through the book and got a lot of value out of it. So I, I shared it with her on our, on our recent therapy session and, and she had good things to say about it too. So yeah, there's, there's people that I already respect and appreciate who've gotten a lot out of it and I'm getting a lot out of it. So I'm, I'm anxious to, uh, to make some of our listeners stretch and squirm a little bit to get through it with us. Okay. So yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to stretching and squirming as well. Um, <laughs> and uh, speaking of uh, some stretching and squirming um, rule seven uh, from oh, uh, yeah. 12 rules for life from Dr. Jordan Peterson is a very long chapter. Um, and there's a lot of emotion that he puts into this. And, um, and, and I feel like this is, was kind of like the, I guess the pinnacle of this book almost in terms of, you know, the, the messages he's trying to send, which is, you know, pursue, pursue what is meaningful, not what is expedient rule seven. What did, uh, what did you get out of this one? Well, the first thing I did was, um, or one of the first things I did, I listened to this chapter twice recently. I listened to it when I was doing my 20 mile hike. And then I listened to it again yesterday. And, um, uh, one of the things I thought about at the beginning was expedient is not a word I hear or use very often. I think I know what it means. I'm pretty sure I know what it means. Yeah, I know what it means, but I'm going to look up the definition of it anyway to make absolutely sure that I do know what it means and not that I just think I know what it means. So the, uh, the definition I saw was convenient and practical, although possibly improper and immoral. Oh, I didn't and, know those at the end there that yes. it would be that they tie that. I mean, a lot of times it's talked about as, but just being, yeah, it's just you, being my, expedient. It's, it's easy. Like, that's what I thought. It's like, you're doing the easy thing, right. easy thing instead of the I, right thing. I, I, me too. I didn't realize and, there was and the way that I love the way that they use that. Well, I love the way that they use the, the word possibly, possibly improper and immoral. 
And what possibly makes me think is I just don't care. Like it's, I've decided it's convenient. I've decided it's practical. Maybe it's immoral. Maybe it's improper, but who cares? Right. Not looking at the consequences of the actions. Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And, uh, and I went through our, uh, 12 rules for life workbook on this chapter and it asks some hard questions. Oh yeah. Uh, and, uh, questions <laughs> that, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not thrilled with my answers to some of them. Yeah. So did you go through and actually answer all those questions? Because I did. Yeah, I, I I'll be honest with you. I I didn't. I well, I there's like, there's many chapters I don't, but this yeah. one because because I was having some difficulty with it. I okay. um I felt like I should, and one of the first questions, and, and and really one of the questions I think anybody who reads this this chapter would ask themselves is, you know, what are your thoughts and feelings on the concept of sacrifice and and how do you decide what sacrifices are worth making in your life and which ones aren't? Mm -hmm. And, and I did some, what I thought was some heavy slash deep thinking about this um, yesterday while I went for a walk and, and, and was listening to it. And I am not much of a sacrificer, especially not for myself. And I think I think I understand partially at least why that is. Mm -hmm. um, and tell me what you think about this, because I was really looking forward to sharing this with you and getting your thoughts on it. Mm. When I was a kid, um, my childhood was fairly chaotic as a result of both abandonment and some mental health issues with my caregivers. And so if, if you don't have a reasonable expectation that tomorrow is going to look a lot like today. Why sacrifice anything? Oh yeah, live for now. Exactly, because you don't know. You have no idea what tomorrow is going to feel like. And and most likely from that explanation, it sounds like today isn't feeling so good. And you want to yeah. change it, and you want to change it, yeah. right? And and a lot of times, things that are expedient, it's an immediate gratification. You know, dope of you know source of gratification, right? Right. It's not. You don't have to wait for it. Right. So you feel like I've got to hoard and guard and consume every good feeling that I have today. I can't afford to put to try to put any of it off for tomorrow because who knows what tomorrow is going to be like. Yeah, that's how I approach my food. Um, basically. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta, gotta get it all down because who knows? Um, no, that, that probably comes from my uh, my mom telling me to clean my plate um, as a kid. But um, but, you know, she didn't in, in all fairness, growing up, she grew up in, in you know, like Nazi Germany basically. And, and, yeah. you know, where food was scarce and, and so, you know, uh, or up until that point. And so, yeah. Um, you know, they didn't have food, so you needed to eat everything on your plate, you know, cause you didn't know if you're going to get fed again. So, yeah, and, that, that, and that translated into her parenting me. So it didn't mean to bring it all back about me, but I, I, I get what no, you're saying no, no. in terms and, of trying to, you know, immediately. You, yeah. And what you just said reminded me of something too, cause my, my ex-wife's grandmother grew up in a Germany that became Nazi Germany, you know, while she was there. Yeah. And the, the thing we, we don't always remember is that uh, Nazi Germany was not a hellish nightmare for Jews and an absolute utopia for the Germans that were there. Right. It was pretty miserable for everybody. Yeah. Obviously it was worse for the, for the Jews, the, you know, others that were, being subjected to the horrors of the Holocaust, but your average German citizen was not having a good time during the lead up to and and uh, and the actual events of World War II. It was it was misery pretty much across the board. Worse for way worse for some than others, but it was yeah the the German citizens were not having a blast. Right. Yeah. My my grandmother also drew, grew up through on my German side. You know, grew up before you know Nazis came into power. And what she had told me was real simple: was everybody was starving, and the Nazis fed the people, and that's how they they really started to come to power. And that was her explanation. Now again, that was yeah. one person. Yeah, yeah. What she told me, but basically that's that's one of the ways that they were able to to you know usurp power. Right. Yeah. It's it it was it was not by any means a. Uh, it was not a nice place to be better for some than others, certainly. But, you know, again, I, I can't I can't imagine that you could have those atrocities going on in your country and, you know, have it not affect you. Even even on a particular day, you're felt your belly's full of food. Yeah. You're still living in the environment where these horrific things are happening. 
Right. So it can't, ugh, yeah, that that's gotta be rough. So anyway, uh, Peterson starts out this chapter with the idea of, okay, if, if life is suffering and you, if you're among the first two people anywhere and the God that made you is telling you, yeah, life is going to be suffering then how can you not just have the attitude of, okay, well, we better ring out any, any pleasure or joy that we can experience. We met, we better ring it out of life by any, any means necessary. Yeah. Just so that it makes the, the misery a little bit less bearable. Yeah. And then, so the, the whole chapter is him basically setting out that idea and then pushing back against it to say, no, here's why, here's why meaning is a better way than, than just trying to get by with what's easy. And, and what feels good in the moment. Yeah. So let's go back. I mean, it didn't sound like you've kind of finished your thought when you're talking about you as a child and, and you were looking for, you don't feel like you do a lot of self-sacrifice and I right. kind of took us down a different path. So was there more that you wanted to share about that? I think that was about it. That just, okay. you know, it's, it is, it is hard where I'm concerned about, you know, my future and, you know, saving resources, money, energy, whatever for a rainy day. It's like, you know, I, I don't know that, I don't know that there's going to be a rainy day tomorrow could be a tornado or it could be sunshine. And so why, why bother trying to plan for it where it could be, it could be so much more amazing than I can ever, you know, even conceive of, or it could be so much worse than I imagine. Mm -hmm. Why, why would I try to save any resources for it? I don't know. Yeah. I think it, this in this day and age, if you compare it to the analogy that you know uh, Peterson comes up with in terms of how um, I think really culture and society or society came to be, um, it's it's a little bit different now because right now it's you know I think of most of us fortunately um, at least here listening to the podcast and stuff like that you know aren't living day to day off of resources right and so. What he talked about was, um, you know, when we were, you know, th thousands or hundreds of thousands of years ago, when we were hunters and gatherers and right. um, we were really, you know, food was scarce. We didn't have convenience stores on every corner that were open 24 hours a day. Um, you know, once in a while, we'd be lucky enough to kill an animal like a, like right. a mammoth. And, um, and then basically what would happen is we would have, we'd be able to eat that day, but, you know, it'd quickly go bad. And right. we wouldn't be able to, to eat after that. We could be starving. Right. And so what's interesting the way he, he talks about this is that, you know, a lot of time, you know, society kind of started and, and, and a delayed gratification came through the fact that there was excess meat. And he right. talks about how if we brought that, if, if let's say, you know, we brought down a, a, a woolly mammoth and we ate it and we realized, oh my God, there's a lot of, there's a lot of meat here. Um, we start to understand the concept of if we save, if we don't eat it all now and we save some for later, that, that we will be, you know, kind of, you know, delaying our gratification. If you don't eat all now, we'll, we'll have some for later. And then, you know, it goes, okay, well maybe, you know, now I've got extra meat. Maybe I will share it with the people I'm caring for my family. And then maybe I'm going to share it with, we, you know, I, and even I still have more meat left over right. and share it with some other people. And maybe if I share it with them, then when they bring down a, a big kill, they're going to share that meat with me. And so now you start to, you know, introduce this concept of trade, you introduce the concept of sharing and, you know, people then are the people who are able to do that, they live, right? And so now that characteristic, that trait is being selected for because the people who aren't sharing right. are the ones that are dying off. And so that, that thought or those characteristics then die out of the population. And so what we're left with is people who are sharing and they're the ones who live and, and they're the ones that were the, you know, there are ancestors. And so those are the people who were successful were the ones who were delaying the gratification of eating all the meat in one sitting. They were actually sharing some of their stuff. And so that started to build, you know, a concept of, of a society. And I thought that was, that was brilliant. You know, he, he, you know, in all fairness, he says that, you know, there, there's not a, uh, you know, it's, it's not, you know, this isn't scientifically proven in any way, but just logically thinking through how sharing may have started, this makes a lot of sense. It does. It reminds me of a conversation that uh, you and me and our friends, uh, Kurt and Richard had on um, Instagram DMs a, a while ago. 
uh, you know, it, it does seem like the next logical step, you know, after we decide, okay, we can share with each other and, and in doing so, you know, instead of, you know, Dan kills a woolly mammoth today and he eats what he and his family need. And then the rest just spoils and goes rotten and it's just gone. You know, instead of that, you share it with the community and then the community, when they get the woolly mammoth, they'll share with you. And, you know, it's like, oh, wow, this works so well. What we should probably do is pick a guy who can be in charge of it and we'll just give him all the food and then he can be responsible for handing it out to everybody. It's like, we kind of see how that, you know, oh yeah, that sounds like it makes sense. You know, right. Stu, Stu over there is a pretty smart guy. He's good at math. He's good at counting, you know, woolly mammoth meat. He can, he could do a good job. But then what happens every time is Stu ends up hoarding a little bit more for himself and taking his cut off the top. And, you know, it, uh, it, it's very easy to see, which is why, which is why I am anxious for our uh, robot overlords to take over. <laughs> Because, I mean, no, look, it's seriously, I mean, I think any time that you try to put a system together where humans are in charge of uh, gathering the resources, storing the resources, and then equally handing out the resources to everybody, people just kind of starve to death. And mm -hmm. That seems to happen every time, right? It's just yeah. a matter of, you know, how long is the countdown clock? Some societies are able to last longer than others right. before, you know, people start starving and they have to flip the game board over and, and start again where there it is possible that at some point a uh, a a superior intelligence could come along that is capable of of managing that for us without the without the biological ape drives that get in the way of being able to do it in a way that's actually beneficial for everybody right so now, and now though you gotta i don't, don't want to take us down that i don't want to okay take us down that, all right that i'll, I'll leave that, i'll leave that on the table because i got some thoughts about that um but so, it is yeah I, I think i mean and i think jordan peterson would agree with the the problem with collectivism, which could sort of incorporate socialism and communism, is that human drives and motivations get in the way of it being a, you know, you can, you can never implement it the way that the philosophy books say it, because these ape drives of ours get in the way of being able to do it. Right. Where yeah. if, if you didn't have a problem of scarcity, if there was always more to go around than, than every human on earth would ever need, and you had somebody who could you know, hand it out in a way that was completely fair to everybody and, and their own desires didn't get in the way, it would probably work. We just know that as the apes we are today, so far it's never happened and it never will happen as long as we're still the apes that we are today. So, and, and that's what, you know, led to a 20th century of hundreds of millions of deaths that uh, Dr. Peterson is quite uh, preoccupied with. I mean, the, the problem of 20th century violence and the political philosophies that enabled it to happen is is a big preoccupation for him and like why why wouldn't it be yeah yeah i mean he makes a point of and you you know you said this on the previous podcast too is that it's um you know by by default um human right. humans have evil tendencies and, and, you know, and by default, there's chaos everywhere. And so when things are good, we shouldn't be asking ourselves or when things are bad, we shouldn't be asking ourselves, why are they bad? It's, right. it should be the other way. Right. It's, it's like, we have to make efforts to make things good, to make things peaceful, to, to calm our minds, to fight off those animal instincts from our primitive brains. And he used the example of one of the, you know, of, of some of the guards in one of the concentration camps in Nazi Germany, um, they, they basically would have the prisoners carry a, a hundred pound bag of oh, salt yeah. back and forth from one end to the other for no reason. And above the concentration camp was the, the sign Arbeit macht frei, which is work will set you free, but free meaning death. And it basically, it, this, this activity they make the prisoners do was just for the entertainment of the guards. There was no purpose of it. It's not like they were, you know, helping, you know, move supplies from one end to the other where they needed them. It was purely to torture and torment these people. And, you know, Peterson makes the, the point, and I totally agree with him. This is pure evil. This is pure malevolent art. He actually called it malevolent art. And, Oof. and, and that really goes to show the tendency of that, that humans can be truly evil. Um, yeah, and and it 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 is amazing when 
when circumstances and events trigger that primitive part of our brain where we feel like in order to survive, we have to do these extreme terrible things. And that sort of ties into what he has to say about PTSD later on in the chapter where he's like, you know, a lot of soldiers, they, they don't get PTSD because they see horrific things. They get it because they do horrific things yeah. and they have a hard time justifying, you know, the things that they that they felt the need to do during war with the person that they that they think they are. And it's like when when you're when your actions don't line up with who you think you are, that that is a a real place of hell for a human to deal with. And, you know, I was thinking about when he was talking about the those guards in the concentration camp and in other parts of the book where he talks about humans that have done really horrible things. It's like it's hard to remember they are humans. This This is not some extinct species of something that's like a human that used to live on earth and is now gone i mean the the guards at auschwitz or sobibor they were humans like i'm a human yeah and that makes me have to ask the question if if i were exposed to those same experiences that they were would i think that oh this is this is just the way i have to be in order to survive and and maintain my safety and my way of life and you know everybody when, whenever any of us read stories about you know, Nazism or Mao's China or Stalin's Russia, we like to immediately have this knee jerk reaction of, oh, I would never do that. I would, right. I would be, I would be the hero that would stand up. And, and it's like, no, I, I'd you, be, you, I'd be the one stuffing Anne Frank in my, and protecting her in my, in, you know, in the attic. Right. I would do that. But meanwhile, right. there's no way you would. There's no way. Right. I mean, yeah, 99.9% of the people in Germany are the ones that would have handed over Anne Frank if they had to, to keep their own family alive. Correct. Right. And so when one person does it, I mean, it's a truly exceptional thing, but, but don't think that we're going to be that, you know, that, that you're going to be that hero because, you know, you, you heard the story and you, you know, it was, it was a romantic story, right. You know, that you're going to have that, that, and, and that's the thing that, you know, frightens me about a lot of the, the stuff going on, the climate, you know, in our current political climate, when it yeah. comes to, when it comes to the handling of, of the pandemic and, and vaccines and, and also what, you know, what, what's going through, what's going on in Canada right now. And so with Trudeau, so all of those things, I mean, it's, you know, it, yeah, like you said, I mean, there was, I mean, the entire, almost the entire nation of Germany was, they weren't rising up against the Nazis for years and years and years. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think of, you know, millions of people were, were, were okay with this. I know, I know. And, and and I, I think about, you know, even, even when we had protests or we we still do um, it's not the, it's not the thing right now, but even thinking about, you know, when people get so fired up about income inequality and, or, or wealth inequality and the 1% and, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm not here saying, what we need to do is have more compassion for the poor billionaires and the things they're going through. But I would say, you know, if I, if I had a kid, I would say the more time you spend preoccupied and thinking, no, the, this other group, this group of people who aren't like me, they're the, they're the cause of all my problems. Even, even if that other group is a, is a bunch of super rich billionaires, it's like, no, it, it does you harm to take on the idea of, all my problems would be solved if it weren't for those people. Those people are the reason my life sucks. And even if you're right, and even if those people are the most lucky, blessed, privileged, wealthy people in the world, it still does you harm to spend your life thinking my life would be better if it weren't for them. Yeah. Because yeah, but- that that is what leads to these atrocities that humans are capable of experiencing, putting off the the responsibility of my life only sucks because of them. Yeah. Well, right. I mean, you know, you can't control other people, first of all. So that's, that's futile, right? So right. It's, a, it's, a, it's a futile exercise. So, you know, nothing's going to change, you know, if you're just totally blaming them because why that means you don't need to do anything for yourself. And that means you're giving up at that point. That's the way I look at it. Well, I mean, no, I mean, no, Dan, we, one of the lessons is something can change. If, if you decide the reason I'm poor is because of these Jewish bankers, then 
let's just gather them all up and put them somewhere so they they won't ruin my life anymore that's right I mean, that's part of yeah. what happened with nazi so yeah right. if, if if you feel it long enough and it's strong enough and it's bad enough yeah yeah it, it can change life in in only the most horrific ways right and but i th- i think i was I don't know if this is in chapter or if, or if peterson said it himself on one of his videos or whatever but one of the things that is critical is you know to kind of you know help you know, limit the the possibility for another Nazi Germany from coming to a, into effect is to ask yourself, could I be wrong about this idea? Right. Right. So these people, like, like you just said, you know, you've got, you're thinking these bankers, these billionaires are the ones that are, you know, causing my life all hell. Well, pause for a second. Could you be wrong about that, that that's actually what's going on? Right. right. Could you be wrong about this idea that, you know, um, everybody needs to be vaccinated to get rid of COVID. Could you be wrong about that? You know, um, you know, is that a possibility? You know, um, in terms of forcing people to, you know, to make, you know, medical health decisions and stuff like that. Like, could you be wrong about that? What are the consequences of that? Right. So just pause and think and ask those some of those questions. Um, and and yeah, I think I think all those. Uh, yeah, I I think all of those things are are important to do. But I'm not claiming it's easy. No, no, no. And I mean, oh, my and God, have, no. You and I have, have even had these discussions before. And, uh, you know, because because you and I are on on pretty different sides of of COVID and vaccination and, and stuff like that. And we right. we used to debate it frequently and, and and less so now, because I remember one time we were sitting at Dexter's and I, I asked you the question. Yeah, I said, you know, Dan, what what would the nature of the evidence look like that would completely change your mind on this whole thing? And you're like, it doesn't exist. And, and pretty much yeah, at that you, point, you couldn't I was like, tell me anything at that point. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so yeah. I'm like, okay, well for Dan, for Dan, my, my friend, Dan, who's the, you know, atheist agnostic, whatever you call yourself, yeah. this position has risen to the point of religion. And I don't try to talk my friends out of their religion because I want them to stay my friends. Yeah, no. And, and <laughs> I, I feel, I feel exactly the same way about people who really, you know, were, were, I'm going to say misled um, with all the information that we were being fed from from the pharmaceutical companies about the vaccines at the very beginning. It's right, and the, the stories keep changing about it, and so oh, yeah. and 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 that and I, you know, it took me a while to also the same approach, which is there's other things about these people that I love and I care about, and I don't want to lose that through you know having a different opinion about things, and also you know I looked at it and it's like you know what you know the the information we've got different sources of information and as that changes people's opinions will will change and things like that so you know i i backed off of that as well same thing about my posting on on you know social media about that and you know uh, it it did help me become a better person because i it helped me you know kind of isolate that issue and can you know make that a, a compartment and and realize that is not that is a very small piece of what another person is. Exactly. And, 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 and yes, and, I, and, and I was there's just so thinking, much more better, so much more value there, right? It's not throwing the baby out with the bathwater that I keep, you know, that I always right. say. And but honestly, it, and it, but it's not an easy thing to do because it's such a it's you know, emotionally triggered, you know, thing, you know. Yeah. And and so yeah, I mean, and and one of the one of the things I tried to accept, you know, months ago when when these debates were, you know, back before World War Three was starting, and it was all we talked about, and all we cared about. <laughs> You know, all I thought was, you know what, and until friends and family members start literally trying to hold people down and either inject them with our mRNA vaccines or make them take ivermectin, it's like it doesn't really matter. Like right. it, until right. until people, you know, right. it, it, and not yeah. just the government or the people, it's like until the people you care about yeah. are are thinking, you know, oh, we need to stage an intervention and I need to I need to hold you down so that I can give you the vaccine that I think you need. It's like yeah. until that's happening. It, it's all just kind of mental masturbation of I want to feel like I'm on the right side of the issue and they want to feel like they're on the right side of the issue. And let's just argue about it until we hate each other. It's like, yeah. no, nope, check, please. I'm opting out. Yeah. Yeah. The, the thing uh, we're going to do the uh, rule um, in the future, I believe we still have it, uh, the the idea that uh, I forget what rule number it is, where you assume that the person you're talking to knows something you don't. Mm, mm-hmm. OK, rule nine. Uh, that's one a great one. The, I love it. One of the hardest, one of the hardest ways you can actually live that out. And we'll talk about this more when we do rule nine in, in a couple podcasts. Um, there's probably no person that it's easier to hate right now than the guy who's driving like a dick in traffic 
and has the bumper sticker for the guy you didn't vote for as president. <laughs> Probably. Is there anybody yeah. that it's easier to hate right now? That, that, that he's, he's just driving like a jerk and his bumper sticker has the name of the guy you don't like. Real easy. No, uh, I would say. Yeah. I mean, so, so imagine that's the guy or maybe, have, wait, maybe, maybe if ahead. he's in a car that's that you can't afford perhaps, you know, oh, yeah. or, um, maybe or like F3, that, right. An F three fifty or a Prius. Yeah. Right. <laughs> depending yeah. Okay. On where, depending sure. on where you come down politically. Right. Yeah. Could be. <laughs> Absolutely. It doesn't hurt for sure. And so if, if you can, if you can think about that guy and say, you know what, his life experience has probably, he probably understands something about the way the world works that I don't. And there's probably something I can learn from him. God, if, if you can, if you can take on that level of tolerance and understanding, yeah. then you're better than I am. Cause that is not my impulse. When I, when I see that, that guy or gal in traffic, I, I, my, my brain does not go straight there by any well, means. Well, so here's the thing is I don't think, I think it's unrealistic if you think our brains are ever going to go straight to, to that, right? My, what I'm, what I'm learning as I'm getting older is, you know, with, when it comes to emotions, it's, it's very difficult to change that initial feeling. Correct. And then it's the, the challenge that we have is I think is, you know, how do we respond to those feelings and what do we do with them? Right. And so, right. And that's where, you know, I would, you know. I would jump, I would, I put on my hat as a, uh, as a cheerleader for mindful, mindfulness meditation. The only thing I've ever encountered in my life that gives me the ability to jump off of those thoughts sooner than I would otherwise is a mindful meditation practice. Yeah. Because then, then I'm, I'm not just, I, I don't fall into these feedback loops where, I get angry and then I recognize that I'm angry. So I get angrier because somebody made me quote unquote made me angry. And then it just keeps ramping up, ramping up, ramping up. And, um, having the, the benefit of, of a mindfulness meditation practice lets me opt out of that cycle way faster than anything else I've ever tried or, or, or come across, you know? Yeah. And just like anything else, you're practicing not getting lost in your thoughts and emotions when you're actually meditating, right? You're practicing coming back out of it. And, and a lot of times we are in this trance when we get triggered emotionally, we're in this, this zone where we're just, you know, riding along with these feelings and, and letting that primitive brain, you know, do its thing and, and make us either fight, flight, or, you know, fight with it, fight, uh, flee or freeze. Yeah. And, um, so, definitely the, that's that's the, the meditation is is huge as well for me you know when i when i'm doing it regularly uh it, it just naturally gives me a moment to pause for a second and just interrupt those feelings and say okay is this is this the direction i want to continue going in yeah and and i know we you know we i try to say this every time we talk about meditation uh, but you know i don't know where people are coming into the podcast this could be the first episode they've listened to so i, I gotta say it again Meditation is not about clearing your mind and spending 10 minutes thinking about nothing, right? Meditation is a workout where you are flexing your muscle of attention and you're making your attention something that you can use the way that you feel you need to use it and, and not just have your brain just get flooded with thoughts that you can't control and, and that you get stuck ruminating on and getting distracted by it's like, no, you attention is probably your, your ability to choose what you want to put your attention on. It might be the most powerful thing you can do as far as the ability to change your life for the positive. And meditation is the time you spend in the gym, getting that muscle stronger and stronger and stronger. And it, it is not about emptying your mind and not thinking about anything and not caring about anything and disconnecting yourself from the world. That is, that is the opposite of what mindfulness is about. Certainly in, you know, every, every app that I've tried and that I've, uh, come across and tried to develop a practice with has been, and, and that would be, uh, waking up. I've messed a little bit with calm and I'm trying to remember the other guy who, uh, who's got a pretty popular app that I've used, not 10% happier, but I've heard good things about that one. Mm -hmm. Um, but really any of them that build themselves as mindfulness, th this is what it's about. It's about building up your mind to be stronger at putting attention on the things that you want the attention to be on, not just blanking out and, and, you know, checking out from the world for 10 minutes a day.
Yeah. And I mean, just like going to the gym, you know, you're going to actually change your body through those practices. You actually are changing physically changing your brain as well. Your, yeah. your brain does change from people who, and they, they've done scans of people who meditate versus those who, who, who didn't, or before, before and after they you know, started a meditation practice. And so you, you are literally physically changing your brain as well. And that the nice part is then you're carrying that with you during the day, right? You're, you're not just, you know, you know, getting that, that, um, that effect, you know, when you're actually doing the meditation, it, it then, you know, right. Just you, like you're, you're not, a, you're not a tool in your belt then. Right. For, you, for don't, the you don't, you don't get, you don't get bigger when you're in the gym, you get bigger, you get bigger that's when you're not point. in the gym. Right. You know, yeah, and so yeah. meditation kind of works the same way. I yeah, mean, you, great point. you, you do the hard work during your morning or evening meditation session, and then your brain and your mind recover from that during the following day. And and that way you can go deeper during the next session that you, that you take on. So yeah, yeah the, it, it works in, in very similar ways. Um, yeah, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm paging through the, uh, the book and, you know, I want to, I want to check back in on some of the stuff he talks about, but there, there is so much religion and biblical history and philosophy in this chapter that it does, it did get a little overwhelming to me. Um, one, one of the things I did want to mention was when he talks about the story of Socrates, and, and I wanted to get your take on, you know, basically Socrates essentially gets, you know, sentenced as a, he's too much of a troublemaker for them to keep around in Athens. So they decide him and all gonna, his questions. Yes. They decide, <laughs> well, what we need to do with this guy is uh, get him to shut up. So we'll tell him he's on trial for being a troublemaker. And then that'll teach him a lesson to keep his mouth shut. And he's like, yeah, or instead of keeping my mouth shut, just go ahead and kill me. If you don't like it, just, just kill me. Yeah. And so I was wondering what you thought about that. And, and do you, would you consider that when you look at his story, do you look at that as a good end or a bad end? I, I mean, I, I, I look at it as a bad end um, because I feel like, you know, um, he, you know, he could have given more and, and just kind of found a way just, been a little bit creative to, to maybe, you know, get his message out or get more information out in a way that wasn't pissing off the wrong people, you know? Um, yeah. I, I had a feeling you and I would disagree about that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, where I I'm jealous, I'm jealous of the way he went out. I mean, I'm not a person that has ever, you know, dealt with suicidal ideation or suicidal thoughts or anything like that, but mm the idea that you could be so confident and so sure that you've led your life the right way that you're willing to say, all right, look, if you guys, you know, you want to give me this out, I'll go ahead and take it. Yeah. I mean, you know, and then maybe that's on me. Maybe it's because I haven't feel like I haven't totally fulfilled, you know, and lived my life exactly the way I want to. And maybe that's, that's what I'm using here as a filter yeah. and going, well, I'm not in his position. Maybe you're right. Maybe if I felt like up until this point, like I lived my life, exactly the way I wanted to. And I've contributed as much as I possibly could. Maybe I'd feel differently. Yeah. But now, I, but I I'm mean, not in that it, position. And don't misunderstand me. I would not do what Socrates did. I would, I would fight it kicking and screaming the whole way, yeah. but I look at it like, what if I didn't have to, what if I didn't feel the need to do it that way? What if I, what if I was able to do it the way he did it, where, you know, basically he, he said, you know, look, this, and, and, you know, it's, it was a different society as well, as far as, you know, medical care and, and what happened and how people died and stuff like that. I mean, he could have gotten some terrible illness. He could have lost his mind, which was the most important thing to him and just gone crazy with old age. That's and a good like, point. That's a good know, point. No, they're, they're giving me a chance to, to leave at the top of my game because right. we've all, you know, we've all seen the actors the musicians the sport players who were they were gripping onto this life so hard and they just we just had to watch them get terrible the thing they used to be the greatest at and socrates is like you know what no not for me screw it you, yeah. you want to give me this out i'll take it yeah f you guys that, that's a good, <laughs> that, right and, and that's a good point is you know at that time the the choices in terms of how you died were you know we were kind of just you know like you just said, there was a lot limited, you know, life wasn't that long. The lifespan, average lifespan wasn't that long. Um, yeah. Uh, I guess, you know, if, if we we're living back then, we add those, those dimensions to the scenario. I could see it. Yeah. The, the one thing, you know, you know how we, um, we talked about 
back when we did Glover's book, No More Mr. Nice Guy, and he used the analogy or metaphor of, you know, training the women in your life with what you want from them. Like you train a dog that pisses on the carpet. I was like, oh, I hate this. This makes me feel so uncomfortable. I wish he didn't say that. Yeah. There is a sentence in this chapter where Peterson does that too. What does at he the say? End of, what, what, which the, one is it? At the end of the Socrates story um, on page 173, he says, uh, instead, he turned the tables, addressing his, his judges in a manner that makes the reader understand precisely why the town council wanted this man dead. Then he took his poison like a man. It's like, uh, like a man. He, yeah. The method that he chose to commit suicide was, we're, we're going to, I mean, I think, again, I, I think there's admirable stuff in the way that he went out. And I think there's there's things to look at. But then tying the decision to do it to like a man, it made me cringe a little bit. Okay. So the way I interpret Peterson saying like a man is with courage. And, you know, that's, that's what I feel like he was, he was, he was saying, and that's what the meaning was there and not necessarily tied to one gender or another. Um, yeah, but you could never say Joan of Arc burned at the stake like a man because she wasn't willing to compromise on, on, you know, being accused of being a heretic. I, I think he could. Yeah. I think he could. I absolutely think he could because I, 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 think, for, that's, I for, think that's condescending to humanhood and femininity. Okay. And in, in this right now, when, when was this book written? Not that long ago. <laughs> um, let's see. I'm looking at the copyright here. 2017 is when the copyright date is. Oh, so, mine, mine's not, like 2018. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah. Um, four yeah. or five years ago. Uh, all right. Uh, Way yeah. back then I mean, was, when it was cool to talk this way. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, the the other thing too is, right? I mean, but he's, you know, he's an older guy and no, everybody I, has, I under, has, has their I expressions. And I, mean, and I feel yes, like just it's like Glover. It's the intent. It's the intent, right? Just like a crime, right? You have to look at the intent too, right? It's not, you know, it, it my, my, and, and the meaning behind words. And, and so, Yes. On paper, if you're looking at the word man and, and saying like a man or whatever, and, and maybe it's not, you know, not something that you would use my, my meaning that how I took that was not that only men have courage, but just, just kind of like, that's just in, in another way of saying having some courage because that's, that's just what he grew up with using in terms of yes. terminology. And we all have, and look, we have our own, we all have our own little expressions and stuff like that, but that one, yes. yeah, that, that snuck yeah. in there. I guess. And, I, and I'm you not know, saying, yeah. I mean, I might even say something like that with the same intention that he had. It's it's very right. possible. Sure. But when somebody pushes back on me and says, eh, that's a little cringy the way you use that phrase there, it made me, it made me, you know, feel a little bit weird either as a man, as a woman, as a whatever, fill in the blank. Just your use of that phrase that way tied to Socrates' courageous decision to commit suicide mm -hmm. like a man, it mm -hmm. makes me feel weird. I'd be like, yeah, I, I completely understand how it would make you feel weird. It makes me feel a little weird too. Right. So, now you're, no, so, now, said, so now you're responsible for everybody's feelings, you're saying. Well, that's a good point. Nobody makes anybody feel any way. Thank you, Dan slash Renata. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I need to I need to get called on that every time I say that yeah. uh, you can't. Yeah, you cannot make people feel weird, right. which um, it actually brings brings, uh, you know, a Florida is currently going through this huge hubbub about this. Um, don't say gay law that uh, I have not read all of the verbiage in it, so I can't speak to it. I, I know that it's making people feel very passionate and very excited that, you know, teachers can't say gay in, in classrooms. Um, and again, I, I don't want to speak to it because I don't know enough about it. I'm, yeah, I, I'm allowed I'm, to not have an opinion. This is actually the current, first I'm hearing about this, actually. Yeah, so I'm, I'm currently not informed enough to offer any kind of an opinion other than I'm a big fan of people being able to say what they want to say, what they need to say, even when it's, you know, in front of children, because then the way that's supposed to work is your child hears something they don't understand at school. And then they come home and they ask you about it as a parent. And then you have a conversation about it. Whoa, um, whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, whoa, I know. Whoa. I know. I know. Slow down, killer. <laughs> I know. But uh, there was there was another uh, bill that passed in Florida recently um, where it was the idea of talking about history and, and some of the things that have happened in the space of racial inequality throughout history. And 
like it was in the text of the bill that you can't say things that will make certain people that make certain people feel guilty about their race because of how their ancestors may have treated people of another race. Okay. It's like, so, so now we're, we're codifying it into the law to say that it's possible for one person to make another person feel a certain way because of the words they choose to use. Right. That's just, I mean, insane. As I've shared before, I'm about half Italian, around 50% Italian, another quarter Jewish, another quarter mutt, just mix of all kinds of things. And I don't want to pretend like Christopher Columbus made some decisions that made the world a better place and some decisions that made the world a worse place. And he doesn't get a free pass on any of them. And I'm not responsible for any of them either, just because I happen to be half Italian. Right. So I take no pride in what he did and I take no shame in what he did because he's not me. Oh, oh, wait, he's a different person? Yes. <laughs> he's a different person who lived hundreds of years ago, whose ancestors came from the same piece of ground that some of mine did. Oh, and you can't control what he did? I can't control what he and and I feel no pride hmm. about what he huh. I feel no pride. I feel no pride about what any person who came before me accomplished because I don't get to own that and take credit for it. And I feel the same way about taking shame. Yeah. You know, it's 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 not my responsibility. My responsibility are the choices that I make. And I'll go I, I will go one further. I do bear some responsibility in ways that I lucked my way into things that other people haven't lucked their way into. Meaning, Example. okay, I was born a man and that makes some things easier. I mean, sure. sometimes when I'm trying to do overhead presses, it doesn't feel like things are coming easy, but they're coming easier than they could if I, if I was, you know, born a female, right? Okay. I was born with a brain that has worked out an IQ score, an SAT score, a standardized test score that other people will never have. I mean, mine's going to, I'm lower than some people and I'm higher than a lot of people. And I did nothing to make that happen. That was luck. Uh, so you don't, so you're saying there was no environmental impact on you for those scores. There could have been some environmental impact, but those are also things that I lucked into. Those, those were not choices that I made. I mean, being a kid who ate a full breakfast before I went to school to take the test, mm -hmm. I, I didn't, I didn't provide that breakfast for myself. It was provided for me. Okay. I did, and, and I certainly didn't stay up studying for it because that was never my style. Okay. Um, the fact that I was born in 1977 America instead of you had no control over that instead Absolutely. of 1420 uh, Russia uh, yeah. or Afghanistan or yeah. uh, Zimbabwe, I had I had no impact on that. You know, the fact that I got this beautiful, symmetrical face with very masculine features didn't do anything to get that. Right. Okay. The amount of testosterone that was in my mother's uterus that has affected this beautiful instrument I call a voice. Yeah. Nothing to do with me. Okay. I what agree I'm saying that. is yeah. a lot of these things that have happened to me are the result of luck. And so I'm not taking, I, I take neither pride in that nor shame in that, but I do take responsibility for it to say, Okay, the fact that I did have some things happen to me beyond my control that other people didn't have happen for them, that gives me a responsibility to reach down and help pull them up that I wouldn't have if I didn't have these things. Yeah, so because um, I, I do believe at a very basic level, the strong and the lucky have a responsibility to help the weak and unlucky because that's how that's how human civilization gets better if we take that burden on for ourselves i don't want somebody else with a gun sticking it to my head saying you know you had all this luck and you you have the strength and in, in your position in society so now you have to help those people no i want it yes. to be a matter of incentive where it's modeled for me by other people. And I just look around and say, okay, I've got things those people don't have. So I have, I have to make the choice to willingly give up some of what I have for them because we'll all be better off if I do. Right. And, and I totally agree with that, that it should be a voluntary thing and not forced. And when you start making laws about it, right. What happens when you violate the law, right? You, right. You get fined and then you get fined fine, and they say, we're going to put you in the cage. And you say, I'm not going to go in the cage. And then they execute you. I mean, right. yes, we, we right. went through that fairly recently. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and so, so I think, you know, I, I wholeheartedly agree. And I think, you know, the, what will happen is the people who aren't 
taking on those responsibilities and they're not being, they're not sharing, right? To me, that's just another equivalent of, of, of when you're taking, when you're helping yeah. people who need help, it's, that's, it's you sharing, right? And, 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 and it's already been, it's, we're selected for you. So the, the people who aren't sharing are less likely to be reproducing. They're less likely to be propagating and, and becoming successful in society. And I think we, we have a, a you know, society that does do that. Pretty good. Um, I mean, I, I think we've come up with systems for making that happen that are better than any other systems that have come so far. We're still working but, on it. Yeah. But yes, there, yeah. there are yeah. there are definitely times to look and say, OK, well, you know, this person is not, you know, they're they're not getting by with that system of sharing and, yeah. and they're they're prospering. They're doing pretty well for themselves and they don't seem to be sharing very much with other people. And we're allowed to feel bad about that now. You know, are we allowed to break into their mansions and throw them out of their fifth story window? I, I don't think that's a society we want to live in either. Right. Right. But, it, but what, yeah. it, what it does take is, you know, again, sitting down with your kids around the supper table and saying, you know, hey, there's people out here protesting this, that or the other. Here's why they feel that way. Here's why the people on the other side feel that way. And, you know, as a family, we get to decide what this issue means to us and what we think the right thing to do is. That's. That sounds great. If but it, but you know. no, I mean, it does sound great. But unfortunately, there are a lot of parents with a lot of different political ideas all over the spectrum. And their idea is now nah, they can just get that from school. And, they, and the teachers at school better be saying the thing that I agree with or else. Right. Yeah. Well, that you can't you can't complain about what the teachers are saying if you're not willing to you know say something yourself. Right. You know, in to, fact, you know, you should want that you should want people outside of your house sharing different viewpoints with your children because. I mean, I'm not going to be that good at trying to steel man an argument with my kid, you know, the, the exact opposite position, the, the opposite opinion on a position that I held. The, the best way for them to hear that is by somebody else who can competently explain it to them mm -hmm. so they can hear their side outside of the house. They can hear my side inside the house and they can decide which one makes the most sense for them. I mean, that's those are the kind of kids I want to have someday that make the world a better place. Right. And I think that starts with, you know critical decisions like understanding how to make you know critical decisions and 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 critical decision thinking so that you you know you know how to go about obtaining different points of view and and properly processing both of them so you can come to your own conclusions and i think that is something that is is really lost these days is are those critical thinking skills um and you know i know um i was lucky to you know to have a couple of teachers growing up through school that you know, emphasize that. And, you know, not that I remember it all the time. And especially right. when you get the motions involved, you know, sometimes it goes right out the window for sure. Um, but, you know, if we can, if, you know, if we can between some mindfulness meditation and, you know, actively practicing, you know, these critical thinking skills and realizing that the benefits are worth putting in the, the investment and time and energy and in, to, to hone those skills, I think, uh, you know, I, I think that's, that's a, a good path to be on for everyone. Yeah, I agree. I, I think it's an essential path. I mean, I think, you know, if we, if we give up the idea of, I need to expose myself to different thoughts and opinions from the ones that I, I hold by default and I need to be willing to explore them and, and give up it's, I mean, there, there are definitely some opinions that are hard to give up because you feel like they're part of who you are, but yeah, you, you gotta be willing to be open to, to new evidence and new ways of thinking. Otherwise you're just going to stagnate and you're going to be just a boring, hard person. And yeah, no, that's interesting. That you make that point that a lot of times we tie those things to our identity and it's, yeah. it's that's why it's important to, to realize that you are not one one piece, you know, you, you're the multiple facets of who you are. And so just because this one thing changes in your mind or potentially could change in your mind, doesn't mean that you are as a person going to radically change. Yeah. You're going to change a little bit, you know, your identity is going to be changed a little bit, but, but, you know, it's not going to destroy you. It's not going to completely. Right. And, and a lot of us really, because I think we, we, we lose focus uh, on, on the, bigger picture of everything that we are. And we're just kind of like going, you know, we're, we're hyper-focused on one thing at a time. I know I have a tendency to say, all right, this is, this is who I am. This specific argument, this point about this argument, you know, gets tied to my identity. And then it's like, if right. I'm wrong about this in any way, 
then 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 who am I? Who am I? Or right. or I'm a bad person because I I was dumb or uh, you know I met and yeah again it's getting caught up in that moment. Um, I feel that that's that's what happens to me at times. Yeah, I uh, I saw a quote recently that I changed to my uh, Instagram profile, and I, I forget who is credited with saying it first. Um, but the the quote is strong opinions weakly held mm. and just the idea that you can you can feel strongly about something but you don't grasp onto that opinion you're you just you can be strong but just hold on to it loosely so that when something better comes along you just let it go yeah and then and then you you grab the next one and hold it strongly um or own own it strongly but hold it weakly so that you can just say okay i i lived with that opinion and now now i gotta let it go too yeah and yeah so that's that's, that's, that's what i try easy. to yeah and in the way that i've said it before is i hate being wrong so much that i don't want to do it for a second longer than i have to mm, that's great i like yeah, that it's i think i think i'm sure i stole it from sam harris where i steal almost all my good ideas but uh yeah the the idea of yeah it's if, if you think you're a know-it-all, if you think you have to be right all the time, then if you want to accomplish that goal, then you have to be willing to chuck the bad ideas as soon as you recognize they're a bad idea yeah. and jump on board the, the good idea that replaces it. Yeah. And maybe, I don't know if this works for you, but I mean, um, I mean, I would think that, you know, you would just, you might take it a little easier on yourself if you think about, well, you know what, this is a piece of information I didn't have before. So yeah, past Dan or past Charles, you know, made the decision with the, the, made the best decision they could with the information they had at the time. Right. And if I had had that information, this information now at that time, I would have made a different decision. I'm not, it's not, I, there's not a flaw in me. It's just, I just didn't happen to have that information. Yeah. Although sometimes, you know, sometimes it's the same information. You're just not ready to hear it. Like we same. Yeah. I'm, I'm saying same kind of, right. Yeah, yeah. Regardless. Yeah. It doesn't matter if you have it. Are you processing it? Right. Is this right. It, right? Like you said, was it, you know, presented to you in a way that you were able to digest it and, and take the meaning out of it that you need to. Yeah. Sometimes I need to read things, you know, quotes and stuff like five, six, right. sometimes 10 times before I I'm know. Like, oh, Me too. Wow. This really one of the uh, yeah. one of the things that has helped me to grow and to open myself up to new ways of seeing the world, and you know, I would recommend this to anybody who has the inclination to try it. Uh, podcasts are great in that you know you can you can really listen to someone for you know forty five minutes, an hour, an hour and a half, however long they want to take to flesh out their position completely on a particular issue. Um, when I learn the most, it's when I listen to someone's podcast who, number one, I consider them smarter than me. So there's like only two or three of those, obviously. But uh, no, you, you find somebody that you think is smarter than you, who you disagree with a little more than you agree with. Like maybe 51% of the time you disagree with them and 49% of the time you agree with them, but you acknowledge that they're smarter than you. And then just listen to what they have to say and and see if if some of that doesn't get through to you and it's got to be somebody you find entertaining it's got to be somebody you find interesting but it's got to be somebody that you're more likely to disagree with initially you know your initial impulse has to be i don't think that's right but are you, so how do you find somebody like that though dude because it's like i mean are you are you value are you you know evaluating whether you're going to disagree with them or that they're smarter than you based on the podcast description like how here's, do you here's, how okay, do you so go about even starting that process good question and, and here's the here's the answer that works for me uh most of those people that i've been exposed to and i've learned about uh has happened through joe rogan's podcast oh I know, I know, but I mean, yeah, I, you know, I've not listened to him very much since he moved to Spotify, but when he was free everywhere and it was really easy to, to find him and listen to him, he had such a diverse range of guests. I mean, all over the political spectrum, the social spectrum, comedians and athletes and philosophers and physicists. And I would listen to all of them. And, and a lot of them would be people that, you know, I was just like, okay, this, this person doesn't line up with me politically, religiously, socially, 
I just, I don't, I don't agree with them on most of what they're saying, but they're saying it in a way that makes me feel like, okay, they actually care about the world being a better place than tomorrow than it is today. And they're also willing to ask themselves some hard questions and mm. give up some of their own ideas when they're proven wrong. Mm -hmm. And so um, that is, yeah, his podcast for, for good or for ill, whatever you think about it, um, it has exposed me to people that I would not have been exposed to otherwise. And, uh, and in my own particular case, from my own, you know, religious upbringing and background, it was mostly people on the left that he exposed me to that I, I was willing to give them a bit of a, of a fair shake and a fair hearing on their own podcast, because I, I heard him interview them on his podcast. And that made me think, okay, maybe this is somebody that's got something to say that I, I need to hear. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you also need to be willing to be uncomfortable. Um, because if you're willing, you know, to, to sit through people, things people are saying, I mean, there's a reason why social media is so popular is because most of the time you're seeing, I mean, a yeah. lot of times you're seeing, you know, you're a bubble of yeah, things of people. You that can agree silo yourself. You yes, silo exactly. yourself really. Yeah. And, and, um, and so it's, it's uncomfortable to, to do that. So I give you tons of credit for, you know, being willing to get uncomfortable and you, what, what, what do you think? motivates you to go through that uncomfort that discomfort because <laughs> uncomfort. i get discomfort i don't even know i don't even talk anymore i'm so glad i didn't have to i'm so glad i didn't have to correct you thank you so much for that i was gonna feel you're, really weird your your miscomfort <laughs> um i think the the sense of exhilaration i feel when i realize that my opinion on an important issue has changed oh like that that really that really gets the dopamine going for me where it's like hmm and it, 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 it honestly, uh, you know, I mean, I'm, here's where I'm hoping that authenticity will, uh, will bring in more people than a controversial opinion. So let's, let's see what happens. Go for it. Um, there's a, a law in Missouri that is working its way through their government. I don't believe it's been signed yet where the government of Missouri is going to ban abortions in the case of endopic pregnancies. What are endopic pregnancies? I believe that's when a an egg is fertilized and implants in a fallopian tube instead of in a uterus. Okay. Which cannot possibly lead to a live baby or a live woman. Oh, okay. So if you get an abortion in this case, you either don't get an abortion and you die or you get the abortion and you go to jail, potentially. I mean, that's that's how it's being sold by left-leaning accounts that I follow. And okay. I've they've not I've I've not yet been fooled by them. So um I'm tending to believe that this is a possibility. Okay. And when I read it, I finally had the realization of, oh, okay, I I guess I'm I'm pro-choice now. Like I'm just flat out pro-choice. And I spent most of my life being very, very, very not pro-choice. Mm. But with this one and with some of the other abortion laws that I, I see these uninformed, unscientific, I mean, when I listen to these legislators talk about what they think they're doing and what they think the science of reproductive health is about, and they just have no clue what the actual science is. It's like, you know what? Okay, it's time to it's time to throw out the aborted baby with the bathwater. <laughs> and I'm just going to say I'm pro-choice now because there's too much chaos and nonsense going on on the pro-life side that it doesn't seem like you the, the priority cannot possibly be life of unborn children with this much just willy-nilly incomprehensible nonsensical look at at what sure. the actual biological science is. It's like, so, if, if you cared about the unborn babies, yeah. you would care enough to crack open an eighth grade science textbook. So you sounded like you knew what you were talking about. So, I mean, here's the thing. There's, there's shades of everything. So you're, you're like pro-choice up until, you know, the, the delivery, like at what, at what point are you, are you, or are you yeah pro-choice regardless of the situation? I am pro-choice. I think that's tough to yeah, say it that. Is, no, it is, it is tough. I'm pro-choice up to the point where um, I am opting out of the debate and opting out of holding strong opinions where, again, unlike some of these legislators, I'm willing to say, I don't know enough about this to set policy. So you're mm -hmm. not going to see me 
getting on Facebook or Twitter saying, here's what abortion policy should be in Florida or Missouri or the United States. Okay. So I would, I'm, I'm going to err on the side of women having the ability to figure this out and handle it. So, yeah, I mean, I, I don't want eight and a half month old fetuses, you know, being ripped out of their mothers. I, yeah. I don't think that's a good thing. Right. But I think an even worse thing is for me to have a strong opinion tightly held where I'm saying I've got this figured out and here's what everybody should do. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I agree. And, you know, I, I, you know, for me, I'm, 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 I'm there with you. I'm, I'm definitely, you know, um, pro, and pro so, choice so when it comes to your health, you know, yes. and, 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 but, but also again, I'm not pretending to, you know, be someone who can set policy or, or preach about it or whatever. And I would want to look at, you know, every situation on a case by case basis, which is, you know, uh, which is impractical. We can't do that. Correct. So, Absolutely. So yeah. all we can yeah. do is we can decide, okay, who are we going to give the power to make this decision? And it yeah. seems like the options are Republican legislators or women and doctors. And yeah. that's a pretty easy call for me to make right. again, based on some yeah. of the laws I've seen in the last year. Yeah. I mean, Look, my my policy, my, my my general policy is leave government out of important decisions in our lives. Yeah, and so you know, okay, other than so other, you me, know, so let the let me go. Let me let me say it. something to win back some of our our crazy right wing fans. The same way that Republican legislators talk about reproductive health, that makes me crazy, is the same way that Democrat legislators talk about the function and use of firearms. Yeah, where they have no clue how the how guns function, what the difference is between an assault rifle and an AR-15 and a semi-automatic rifle. And it's like, right. if you really give two shits about this issue, take 20 minutes to watch a YouTube video and you'll understand exactly how these guns work and yeah. you won't say the wrong words anymore. Right. Yeah. You know, and it's funny because, you know, there's a lot of memes going around how, you know, um, you know, I was an infectious disease expert. You know, for for two years and now, I shared it myself. right? Yep. I think I pulled that from you, and now I can't wait to be a you know, a, you know, a, a diplomacy expert or whatever. You know, yeah, and, exactly. Because everybody an expert, and that's the thing is, you know, you, these people who are you know in our government are also not infectious disease experts. They are not, you know. Uh, most of them are not diplomacy expert. You know, it, they have a little bit of, of education here and there. I mean, maybe they have access to a little bit more information than we do, but you know, when it comes to like personal decisions, when it comes to like, yeah, it don't give them more credit than, than they've shown. And look, I know they're, they're dealing with so many complicated issues. They can't be experts at anything that or at, at everything rather. Jack but of all the trades, I, master of none. Right. But the idea that they're willing to open their mouth and say things that again, an eighth grade science textbook right. could clear up it, it like the, the, so i would be i would be scared to death to put myself out there and say something that could then be proven so wrong and then just yeah. let it out there and uh. so the scary thing for me is not them opening their mouths it's them writing laws or enacting acts or or where there's penalties based on right. these this this you know misinformation and and yeah. or 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 these these ideas that have not been vetted, and then they pass laws that don't even get read by the majority of the, of the people voting on them because they get pushed through. And yes, these are not inconsequential. Problem. These are not inconsequential. Sometimes these 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 bills are you know billions of dollars, sometimes right. trillions where they're not even read. I don't know if people realize that most people in Congress don't actually read the bills that they're voting on. Right. They just they're rely right. on their staffers to tell them what they say. Which. Yeah, and and some, some of these are, are thousands of pages long and they can't be read physically. They cannot be interpreted in the amount of time that they have to vote on. Yeah, from, when, that the, is, that from, is yeah, from when the ink dries, from when they finish writing the bill to when they vote on the bill, no human being could read it in that amount of time, much less comprehend it and and say, oh, wait, no, there's something scary in here. Yeah, right. And this is and, the system it, that's just that become we, our status. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. It, it's it's the system that that is in place. And this is and we are allowing, you know this to basically run the free world. And it's, it's, it's correct. It's, it's, it's insane to me. Insane.
All right. You think, anyway, uh, sorry. You think we're going to have any listeners after this podcast? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. Subscriber count is going to go. Besides, besides, besides Kurt and Richard, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We got to like, oh, get Renata back on the show. So our, quick, our quick. listeners spike again. Resuscitate, yeah. All right, man. This is this was, uh, this was a long one, but um, I yeah. thought this was good as well. And uh, yeah, we'll be back with uh, chapter eight um, uh, next week. Okay. Um, yeah. Thanks, Dan. I will. Uh, we're going to uh, we're recording this on a Friday and the next Monday in what three days our our first episode on this book is going to drop. So I hope uh, I hope everybody enjoys it. Um, you and I talked about it yesterday. We're going to release two a week now. And that's we'll do it. We'll do it. Crap out of me, but I hope it's going to go well. <laughs> and let's, I'm, I'm uh, looking forward to it. let's get comfortable being uncomfortable. All right. Yeah, man. that's what we're going to do. All right. Talk to you soon, Dan. Bye. 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 Thanks so much for spending time with us on the Mindfully Masculine podcast. If you liked the episode or you think it would be useful for someone else, please leave us a review and join the Mindfully Masculine group on Facebook. Remember, fellas, don't act masculine. Be masculine.